great to see you all. Um, I will give a talk today about um, improving your code using type guards. And I got already like a, a nice introduction. Yeah, my name is Benny. In uh, the internet, I go by the name of uh, Benny Code. So you can find me in many places. And during the day, I work for South Pole. Like South Pole is a very big um, company helping enterprises and individuals to um, calculate, reduce, and offset their emissions through software. So we give uh, APIs to then um, do um, yeah, reductions through, for example, carbon credits. I also have a little side hustle. So uh, during the day, I work at South Pole. And during the night, I'm running TypeScript TV. So that's a YouTube channel with free tutorials about TypeScript that I publish there. And that also brought me here today, because you are also like TypeScript fans. And I also like to talk about TypeScript, get insights. And today, I want to share some of the tricks that I found with um, type guards. And um, as a preparation for this talk here, I checked what is actually a type guard, because it sounds so easy. Yeah, there's a type and the guard. But uh, what does it mean like by the specification? And I came across um, Wikipedia. And Wikipedia said that um, a guard is actually like um, yeah, um, a statement like in your program that um, is a Boolean expression. So it's about Boolean, yes or no. And uh, that can uh, evaluate a part of your code and tell you if you should proceed within that range or not. So this is like on the outer level. Yeah? So it's about like Boolean expression. And that then like checks a branch in your code. So a branch can be like if and else. Yeah? If you go branch A, else branch B. And um, the type guards are also, for example, found in Python. So that's what Wikipedia says. Wikipedia says, hey, this is a type guard. You can find them in Python. I was very sad about it because I like TypeScript, and I would love ha to have had a TypeScript example. But they bring up Python here. And it's interesting that we see here the branches, if and else. We see that um, there are two types, string and float. And here is a check if um, it is actually a string or float. Yeah, and then one direction takes the assumption that it is then a string, because here's the type guard that narrows down string or float to just string. Yeah, so from two options, we go down to one option. And this is actually like what a type guard does. It helps you to narrow your types. Yeah, if you have like a lot of options, what it can be, then with the type guard, you can um, determine one of the options. And um, I checked in the TypeScript handbook. This is my favorite resource to um, educate myself about TypeScript. And they also say, hey, we have type guards. And um, it's an expression, a runtime expression, they say. That's very important, which means that the type guard produces actual code. So what you write there, when you emit then the JavaScript code, that's actual code in your JavaScript. And it does then the check on the runtime, so when you execute. Not at design time when you code, but on runtime. And um, on design time, of course, the TypeScript compiler can help you. But it's an actual runtime check that guarantees you then that you have the type at hand. And um, yeah, why are they called guards? Yeah, because uh, they can actually guard your code from making mistakes. Because when you have a type guard, then you know in that branch, you know that you have a specific thing at hand. Yeah, it's not a question anymore. You know it. So and TypeScript comes with three type guards that you can use. So the first one is type of. Yeah, type guard, type of. Very easy to remember. It is uh, for checking primitive types. Then there is the in. So just in, within, you can check if a property exists. And then there is instance of. With instance of, you can check if something is of a class. Yeah. And um, if you are like more um, a visual person like me, who likes to um, yeah, see things like as a, as a person or figure, then type guards look like this. <laughs> yeah, so these, these are the three built-in type guards. And you can also define your own. So there is also the possibility to have user-defined type guards. And uh, this uh, yeah, gives you then the possibility to build your own ship. And that's also like what I want to show today. So do you want to see the type guards? Yes. Yeah? <laughs> OK, then I will um, leave the slideshow here and jump into VS Code, because I brought some code examples with me. And then we can check how it looks in VS Code and uh, what IntelliSense will tell us about the types. So. Let me hop a bit. So that's a nice loading animation. Uh, 
I will check if I can duplicate the screen. And there we are. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, live coding can go wrong. So that's why I have most of the things already written here so that we can fully focus. Um, is it big enough for you? Can you see the, the text here? Yeah? Great. Because uh, first we have to... Bigger? Yeah? <laughs> okay. Let's try it with this. Um, we have to set some terminology. So there is, um, for example, a type inference. This is when TypeScript infers the type for you. Yeah, we see here in IntelliSense, TypeScript sees that this uh, constant is assigned to value, and it uh, tells us that the type is value, which is interesting because it doesn't tell us that it is any kind of string. It knows the specific string. Yeah, it knows about the literal value. Then type annotation is where you annotate the type yourself. And although we have the value type here, we tell TypeScript that this is a string. So IntelliSense now shows us it can be any kind of string. Yeah? So here, we actually widened the type. Like the thing that was just a value can now be any string. So we widened a narrow type, we made it bigger. And then type assertions, which I find very um, funky and dangerous. <laughs> because uh, here, you um, assert a type to something that you think might be right. Yeah? So here you say value is string as string, but you can also like invent something. Yeah? I can say that this here is now, let's say, Prisma. And TypeScript will believe that, although we see that it's value, but I can say it's Prisma. And then TypeScript says, yeah, it's Prisma. <laughs> so, uh, and then we can say, um, if our type um, expression equals um, value, because we see that it's value, right? And uh, we will see um, a compiler error because um, TypeScript says, hey, um, this can never be true because it's uh, Prisma, right? <laughs> but it's actually value. So um, that's like uh, um, very interesting to see that an if condition that is actually correct is here incorrect in that case. So um, what um, have we learned? We have learned what is type widening. Yeah, when we turn a literal into like a wider type, we um, will also hear about type narrowing because that's what you have type guts for. And um, we saw that um, you can do um, f create faked types by using the S syntax. Let's see um, the first type guard, which is here the type of. Type of is the easiest one. Yeah, you've seen the three guards, like it was the one on the left. And uh, with type of, you can say, okay, you have a union type here. This is a union of two. And you want to check, okay, is it now a string or is it a number? And um, you can do that with a simple type of. Yeah, if you have an if condition, that goes back to our definition of a guard. A guard was like a Boolean expression. So we have a Boolean expression. Is that true? Yeah. And if the type of input is number, then that's true. And then IntelliSense uh, can tell us that here the input is a number. So we guard the type within that scope. And this is um, the bare essence of a type guard. Our code is now guarded in that scope and we uh, can operate here with a number and we don't have to pass it. For example, like if I would uh, put here pass int and I put in uh, the input, yeah, then um, it's something that is unnecessary because it is already a number. Whereas um, here where we have the string, like uh, in the else case, the um, assumption now is that input is a string because it's not a number and it can be only string or number. So when it's not a number, it must be a string. Yeah, this is what TypeScript also knows by using that type of type guard. The next thing is um, the sample with the in. I have to check that sample because this sample is more interesting as it goes beyond the limitations of type of. Because type of has one uh, flaw, or not flaw, it's just not <laughs> implemented like this, but um, type of can only check off, uh, check the primitives. So it can only check numbers, strings, booleans, but it uh, has um, yeah, a hard time with objects. Here, for example, I check the type of um, dog or person if it is, uh, for example, an object, and both are objects. So if I check the type signature of the dog, then I see that it's an object. Yeah, I hear the curly braces. And the same for the person. They're both objects. So this thing here doesn't help me because type of uh, will tell me it's object for both of the cases. So when I look at my dog or person, I will see that it is dog or person, still a union. TypeScript can't help me here. And I can't put anything else here yeah, because if I check 
what IntelliSense gives me, I see only these basic, uh, basic things. And if I would write now something like doc, it would tell me that, um, that uh, it is not possible because that condition can only have like the easy ones. So that's where in comes into play. So here I have a doc, the doc has a name. I have a person, the person also has a name, so they have the same signature so far, but they have two different methods. The doc can bark and the doc can run and the person can shout and walk. And I have a make noise function, so I want them to go very, very wild. And um, with the in type guard, I can check for a property that distinguishes both types. So I can say, okay, if there is a bark method that only the doc has, then TypeScript knows that it must be a doc. So the doc or person now narrows down to just a doc. So when I check now IntelliSense, I can see that I can bark or run, which I can't do as a, as a person. And in the else case, I will also see then that um, it must be now then a person, because if it is not um, a dog, then it must be a person, and uh, the person can shout or walk. Yeah, and this is also what you gain with that. Um, that's in for objects, very useful. If we turn those um, objects, the types, into classes, then we can make use of something else, because we now have proper classes, and we can then use instance of. Yeah, and instance of is then um, same thing like in, just um, for classes and you can check them against the constructor. Then um, is now a question that I often hear, which is, okay, you have this in, you have this uh, type of instance of, why can't you just, or why can't you not just check with an if? Because um, we have um, the doc here and why can't I just go and say, okay, if, um, doc or person, and then I check on a property that um, the doc own has, for example, bark, yeah, and why can't I just check for this and do it with a simple if, yeah, because TypeScript will uh, tell me, huh, bark doesn't exist because it um, checks what do th those uh, two have in common, they only have the name in common, and um, since doc or person only have the name in common, that's the only thing I can check and I can't check for bark. Um, I actually can check for bark which um, is a very cool thing, which is called the never type. Um, the never type will allow me that. So for example, I can check for, for a non-existent thing of something. So let me um, just run an easier example. I have a user payload that have a has a status, and I have a location payload that also has a status. Both have status number, but they have two different properties which uh, distinguish them, users and locations. Location payload has locations, user's um, payload doesn't have that. So if I check here um, my payload, and I want to check, okay, for users, because then I know if the payload has um, a user's property, it must be a user payload, um, then TypeScript will tell me again, okay, that doesn't exist on the location, so you can't use that here. But I can say that um, my location never has users. And when I do that, then TypeScript can help me here and says, okay, that's fine. Now. It uh, knows a little more, but you will see that it still isn't sure if it is user or location. It still thinks it's um, a union type yeah, because I need to now um, implement that for all other properties. I need to um, duplicate uh, my code uh, in a way for the signatures that I have always like the same properties but was never assigned to the other one. And that's like a very tedious work. There is though a very useful case for never, which is, um, here, a switch case, which I find very, very cool. This is why I want to share it. It's a uh, little unrelated to type guards, but it's super cool to know. So let's say you have an enum, and um, you want to handle always all cases of that enum, because your enum could live in a different file. Yeah? You use a library, it's living in a different file. Now your coworker puts in a new um, value here for the enum, and you want to know about it, and you want that you handle that in your cases. And um, you have here a switch, and you handle the case online, and you handle the case offline. And then you have a default case, which is actually um, not used, right? It's not useful because there is only online and offline, so why do you have a default case? Well, if you check what is the response now here in that default case, what can it be? TypeScript will tell you that it's never, yeah, because it can never occur. And you can make use of that because you can say, well, if that's the case, then I will assign like a variable here to response status, that is of type never. And whenever I now add a value here in my enum, let's say idle, then 
this thing here will run crazy because um, it is not never in that default case. It's now, it can now be idle, yeah? and you get a compilation error. And that's very cool because this makes sure that when you modify your enums and you add values, you have then to like also um, yeah, build these cases in for the rest of your code base. Yeah? So that's a very cool thing that I can advise, um, can help to improve the code base. And um, what is also now nice, um, what you can uh, build as well, is a type predicate. So that's the force uh, section, like the force type card that I was showing, the, the ship, yeah? And this is about writing your own type cards. So we've seen the three uh, type cards, yeah, the, the three heroes there. And now we can build um, a force one where we can do everything we like. And this one I see very often in um, catch clauses because uh, there is one thing that is uh, not so good about um, the TypeScript implementation here is when you're catching an error, yeah, you would like to say, okay, that error is an error, but uh, this is not possible in TypeScript. It will tell you that an error can only be any or unknown. Yeah, and uh, we all know that any is uh, something you should be very, very careful uh, with. So I would then suggest to always say, okay, unknown, I don't know what error that is. Because uh, remember, in JavaScript, you can throw new errors. Yeah, you can throw a new error, and then you can do this. But you can also, in JavaScript, throw anything else. Yeah, so just strings, uh, which is crazy, but doable. And that's why TypeScript tells you, um, yeah, that error here can be everything, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be an error class, an error instance class. So that's where um, type predicates uh, come in handy. Actually, the type predicate is, let me just make it a little bigger, is just this snippet here, this thing, where you can say, okay, um, if this condition, yeah, again, Boolean expression, if this condition is uh, true, then I know that the error that I give in, my, my candidate, my input, is of the type that I'm specifying here in the predicate. And uh, here you can write um, all the statements you like, and actually, like, the Axios request library provides you an Axios error object that has a property called is axios error. Yeah, so you can check, um, is that error first of all defined? And if that error is of type object, then um, we narrowed it down, right? We know that first of all the error is defined. We know that, that the error is an object. So now we can use our in check because in check is there to check properties yeah, for, um, for specific objects. So now we're checking if this object error has the property is axios error. When yes, we return true, otherwise false. And then we can use this type guard in here, and it will allow us that TypeScript will infer this, or not infer anymore, like it's not inference, yeah, it's narrowing down. We are narrowing down our unknown object to an access or error object. And then we can access all the properties it has. For example, we see um, it has a response, and then uh, on the response we get a status, and then we can use that, and we are safe here in that, in that branch, yeah. And um, for the type predicates, you can go very, very um, crazy. So that's what I want to show you in the tool belt. Um, there is a library yeah, from uh, Naaman that I want to highlight here. He uh, created this library here, tool belt uh, type predicates. And uh, this one gives you already type predicates that he implemented, for example, to check if something is an array or a string. Of course, for an array, you could uh, also say, hey, I want to have array is array. And then you pass in an array, right? You use the native functionality. But this will only tell you that the argument is of any array. Yeah, you don't know the value in these arrays any more then. But uh, using, like, for example, this library and the is array uh, functionality from here, you can uh, apply generics because type guards also work well with generics. And you can say, okay, this array needs to be validated for string values. And then you know inside here that um, your array is of type string, it's a string array. Yeah, it's uh, more advanced than just saying array is array. So that's uh, what I wanted to highlight. And um, yeah, I also reached the 20 minutes. <laughs> so um, time to say a thank you to some of um, my resources that I've been using. Um, just want to show them here. Yeah, so um, of course, Wikipedia, then I was reading about widening types, narrowing types. Um, the never trick I found on the way, and of course, uh, Naaman for providing this, this cool library.
who wants to catch this? Yeah? Should I? Uh, okay. <laughs> Perfect. So the question is, uh, why, can, why shouldn't we use, uh, let's say, any uh, when, we, uh, when we use types out? Uh, let's say we check this something of type uh, of something, right? And we pass uh, value. And why it should be like specific types? It should be, I think, any. Ah, you mean in my type pr predicate, or? Yeah, 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 it should yeah. be any, and probably you should check different branches. So you, or you would suggest to use uh, the approach which you showed. Like yeah, so yeah. Uh, you're referring to my type predicate, right? Where I was checking the yeah. access error? Yeah. Because I said that the input is like unknown, and then I was uh, yeah. finding yeah, out, I mean, yeah. yeah. Any or unknown, yeah. I think, because in your example, it was just two types, yeah. and uh, I think that the it might be the right way to, to put like any or unknown because like you can check different um, options basically. But if if you have like another argument, please share. Yeah, we just yeah. So um, should I go yeah, back or? Go back. Yeah? <laughs> oh, big pressure. Works pretty well. <laughs> that also works. So um, I think you can write type predicates where you accept. Any, anything, yeah? Because it would be nice to throw your type predicate, especially like if you build a library, as we've seen, then it's great if that library accepts um, any input. But um, you need to be very careful because you need to check your type predicate then with different types. I had it as well with the access error type predicate when I was developing it. It worked quite well um, with objects. Yeah, as long as I was passing an object, it was cool. But when I passed in a number, I saw that my type predicate um, crashed. And this is something that um, I want you also to be aware of, that the type predicate that you write also uh, will uh, compile to JavaScript code. So it's code that is being executed and it can crash if you have a mistake in there. So when you accept anything there and you don't, for example, check if it simply exists or if it is an object, then uh, the predicate can crash. Yeah, and uh, that's why I just specified a type in my predicate as well, so that inside there, like um, I know already that, for example, um, it is an object. Yeah, and um, so long story short, um, use any, <laughs> but really like test yeah, and your, your type predicate with various types. You can also catch me in the break, I right? I said <laughs> <to> Bravo. <laughs>